Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank Professor Mauro Shatter so much, also Professor Brites for the honorable invitation. It is a pleasure for me to be here. I love this state, these people, and this culture. I'm always very happy to be back to Bahia. So, I'd like to thank Professor Monica for switching with me because uh, I had some issue with my agenda. I couldn't be here in the afternoon. Thank you so much, Monica, for your kindness. So those who preceded me helped a lot because they established the foundations for this discussion that is to come. This is a female 48. Um, She's just uh, been um, with us recently. She was seen in a different specialized care services, and she was admitted with us. I mean, we were a reference hospital, so we get this case in our infirmary. She, she was referred because of a, an acute uterus bleeding, um, in also high pain, hypogastric, and in two weeks she's been diagnosed with a uterine mass. It was a polymenorrhea that had already been investigated and a uterine tumor, suspicions of a myomatosis. Um, according to the uh, images with heterogeneous content in the uterus cavity, this is uh, still under uh, investigation. Whether or not this is an amyomatosis, she did uh, hormone replacement to try to decrease this bleeding one month before admission. But uh, she, is, she is one person living with HIV since 1993. So you will certainly identify several of the situations we are going to mention because we frequently see such cases. She, throughout her life, unfortunately had uh, the regular treatment, a low adherence to the antiretroviral treatment, but luckily she had uh, no history of opportunistic infections. She even uh, had the records in her health care car of a, of a TB test. But given the adherence, given other priorities, unfortunately, she didn't treat for the latent TB. She's a former tobacco user, former alcohol user. She, she's been uh, without uh, tobacco or alcohol for 11 years, and she got to us with a normal creatinine. In the first uh, semester this year, this uh, individual had already uh, gone after other hospitals. Initially in June, I'm sorry, no, I, I mean it was in January, because she had a deep venous thrombosis of the lower limbs. And then once again in June, I mean March, and then June once again with a thromboembolic phenomenon. Uh, and she was being studied uh, for a suspicion of a thrombophilia. And uh, we are also studying this situation. And with this uh, in between, she got onto QI later, given this thromboembolic uh, uh, event. I mean, she had evolved with a pulmonary thromboembolism and together with his uterus injury, a, a lesion, and the intensive bleeding. She was complicated. She evolved to anemia, but with no need for transfusion. That's why they requested us to admit her in our hospital. This is her history of the antiretroviral treatment. She, I mean, we do not have all of the data, because you know well that on the website of the Ministry of Health. We have data since 2011. So we could not get uh, older data at the original services. So she was diagnosed in 1993. So we don't know exactly what uh, she was prescribed from 93 to 2011. But we know that she's probably gone through 
you know, the journey on monotherapy, uh, dual therapy, first PIs without uh, return of your boost. I mean, she's probably been through all these phases. And then what we have data for in the Ministry of Health since 2011 is that she she was on the Zidovudin, Amivudin, Lapinavil, Litonavir regimen, and then in June 2015, Lamivudin, Tenofovir, and Favirans, and then in March 2016, she, there is a registration of a genotyping. She was probably on virological failure with this uh, triple uh, regimen that we used to apply already, and she uh, she had this genotyping requested. She's genotype B, and in reverse transcriptase she was 65 R. She had 100 I, 103 N, 138 A, 184 V. And in protease, she had uh, 10i, 13v, 16e, 46i, 54v, 76v, which is a uh, mutation to the Ronavir, and 84a. And right there, she was just uh, requested a tropism test because they had already expected, given the history which we did not have access to, she had multiple failures to nukes or non-nukes and probably to protease inhibitors. With this, we uh, she was proposed to this new regimen. She started on in September 2016. So those of the the right there, one that Unavir 600 milligrams and 100 of ritonavir twice a day. We still do not have assessment on viral load, but you can see that right after that, in 2017, in May, uh, she was requested a new genotype, and shows she, she was probably kept on virological failure, and she kept this regimen under virological failure, including raltegravir. And right there, she's got basically the same mutations, but a, an integrase the genotyping was just also requested, nobody detected no integrase mutation, despite she's been in failure with rotagravir for a few months already. Then in June 2017, the proposed regimen was tenofovir, dolutegravir, 50 milligrams a day, so they did believe in the genotyping. They did not double the dolotegravir dose, and she kept the lunavir, uh, renovir 600, 100 twice, uh, to every 12 hours. In August 2018, I don't know exactly why, you know, the reason behind it. I'm not sure it was precisely when we had those issues of women infertile, you know, age. They were afraid, uh, you know, in terms of not getting pregnant. She was switched back to... Uh, and then we started to have data. In, in 2020, we started to have good data in the Ministry of Health. And then we see that with this regimen, she was in failure under Altagravir for quite a long time until about March 2023. So since 2020 to 2023, she evolved in failure. She had an under 100 CD4 count, always failing. And then she was referred to us under this condition, the latest viral load before hospitalization in June 2023 was 10,000 with a 102 CD4 count. And then we thought of optimizing the regimen in the best possible way. She uh, decreased the viral load, but she still kept 424 copies. And we know that for us to do genotyping according to the Ministry of Health, we have to have more than 500 copies. So that is a, uh, an issue we could be discussing too, what we can do in this situation. In Sao Paulo, we have... Uh, uh, 
Adolfo Lutz Institute and this Luis Brigido, Luis Brigido, although we call him Luda, but he works with the low viremia. He's got a low viremia project. We uh, have the luck of being able to refer such cases to him for him to amplify with the low uh, viremis. So she, he tried, but he wasn't successful because of a very low viral load. There is a problem of the RNA degradation and pre-test issues, sometimes it degrades in the environmental temperature, and sometimes we can't, and he didn't, he, he couldn't manage. So we kept on with his regimen, and now in August, she has a viral load of 84, CD4 went up a little bit. Keeping in mind here the three mutational pathways, this slide belongs to Ricardo Diaz, I'd like to thank him. The three mutational pathways of Raltegravir, and the most concerning one to us is the 148 uh, HR, which may lead to cross resistance to Dolutegravir, which already is a second generation integrase inhibitor. And this is our major concern in this particular case. But then, uh, at the hospital admission, that wasn't just the gynecological issue that affected the individual. Uh, she had been coughing for three weeks, uh, intermittent fever, and six kilogram weight again. She was already a small lady, a very considerable weight loss. And um, thorax tomography showed these uh, formations with um, um, spent. Uh, is negative uh, molecular test uh, the spit was uh, negative we asked for a test in the bronchovalvular um, negative crag tibilan in urine negative and also in urine washout was also negative. So what we do with these uh, traces? Actually, uh, the uh, CT was quite suggestive. Uh, it was a classic uh, su suggestive of uh, images. But the, in, the Ministry of Health says that in t children, we should regard it as uh, traces of tuberculosis. And then we treat it. So I brought some questions for us to discuss. As it was mentioned before, the treatment of tuberculosis is much easier when we have the formulated uh, agents in the basic regimen. Every time we have problems uh, to conciliate antiretroviral with anti-TB drugs, we break down the regimen, and this is a challenge, but uh, luckily we started to have rifabutin back to Brazil. We spent quite a long time without it, but we needed, in these cases, to conciliate Darunavir, Ritonavir, we could not withdraw it from the regimen. We needed to use levosfloxacin, which is not as effective as rifamycin. But now we still we have a rifabutin back again. That was our suggestion. We don't know how sensitive this the patient is because it's in under um, you know study traces would not allow us to know whether it is sensitive to rifamycin. You know it's indetermined. So we started this regimen and we kept it there. We reinforced the adherence. And I, I would like my colleagues to. Uh, helping the discussion. What do you think about these particular cases of uh, proviral RNA, you know, genotyping or other techniques, or whether you suggest uh, uh, changes to the um, antiretroviral therapy? We have Stephen Monica, we have Mauro, he's uh, pretending he's not listening to my call, but never mind. And um, and at last, only to remind you that we fear so much a resistance to integrase. We do not want to lose integrase. Integrase is very important. Integrase inhibitors are very valuable. We appreciate them so much. So we do have uh, not only the mutations to the integrase gene, but outside the integrase gene, which are still researching, such as the three-line PPT, 
which is a resistance that was published internationally. Ricardo's group has already published. Mauro and Ricardo have already published the findings of such resistance in Brazil. But more recently, we also have uh, resistance to integrase in GN gag and in the GN envelope. These are new techniques we will have to genotype, I mean, other targets. And we concerned, we think, uh, we are so thankful to integrase inhibitors, we don't want to lose them. And remind us of the challenges to these individuals who are already low adherence and they end up being affected with the situation of having to take multiple tablets. And I would like to open this. This is just to, to thank, this is to thank Ricardo who supports the Corinthians football club and his lights, but also to provoke Stefan because now it will be difficult, you know, we will fight, uh, we will um, play against the Flamengo next time in the finals.